we're looking at chapter 7 and chapter 9 in the reading you had for this session and these lectures. And the next chapter we needed to read was 11, is that right? 11 or 10? 10? And 10 is uh, one of the areas that I have worked a lot in over the years. And I have to confess that I even wrote this chapter. Uh, I think maybe my favorite part of it was, uh, although it's very sobering, Ilsa. You remember Ilsa at the beginning? Friedrichsdorf, who starved to death, caring for, uh, for German troops and German people after the fall of Berlin in World War II. And uh, two ways of reading the New Testament. Chapter 10 really is meant to introduce students to the fact that uh, in the actual modern world that we find ourselves in, there are a lot of people that read the New Testament from the standpoint of skepticism. And then there are other people that read it, and they're open to the possibility that it might be true. And of course, if you read it that way, and then you decide, you know something, it is true. Well, then you could say you read it from the standpoint of faith. And this particular textbook is written from the standpoint of two people, myself and Walter Elwell, uh, that we bought the farm, right? We call Jesus Lord. And so uh, some of you, I've, I've heard it from the beginning here, you send your, your, your sons and daughters to college and then you're nervous about the classes in Bible or religion they take. Why? Well, because you know that in the university, and actually it's true also in the church, there are professors or there are pastors and they don't believe in the Bible. They don't think it's true, or they only think certain parts are true. So part of their ministry is to straighten you out. And especially maybe while you had this experience in university where you had a skeptical professor who kind of tried to find out who the believers were and then, then went after them. And, uh, you know, saw it as his or her mission to destroy their faith in, the mir in miracles and their faith in a Christian God, their faith in morality, and so on and so forth. So that's what this chapter is meant to do, is to introduce college students to uh, historical criticism and to the, the methods of historical criticism, to do so in a way in which, uh, you know, they get a real exposure to what it's about, what it claims, but then also uh, to give a little pushback to that and to uh, argue that it's not all the way the critics make it out to be. So on page 152, you've got a summary. And the long and the short of all this is this kind of number nine, a sound hermeneutic recognizes that the New Testament relates the story of Christ as the Old Testament foretold, that various witnesses depicted this story, that in Acts the story was spread, that the story was applied in various settings in the epistles, and that it will culminate one day in cosmic judgment as prophesied in Revelation. Another way of putting that would be, if you can say the Apostles' Creed, then that's a pretty good hermeneutical framework for reading the Bible. What's the Bible about? Well, basically, I believe in God the Father Almighty, I mean, in the beginning, God, right? So there's a reason that the Apostles' Creed is so ancient and why it so, has been so widely recited in the three great Christian communions, uh, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and, and Protestantism. There's a reason why that particular creed sort of stands out, and that's because it provides a hermeneutical grid that helps us both with the theology of the Bible, what does it teach about God and salvation, but also the history. Uh, Jesus Christ is only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. That's a datable event. And so, you know, at the core of the Apostles' Creed is, a, is a, an affirmation about the incarnation, you know, in the time of, uh, of uh, the Caesars. So that's chapter 10. And I don't, I don't want to belabor this. I just want to, uh, you know, underscore that... Uh, to, to have a class in the New Testament at the college level, you know, we have to be aware of the fact that we live in a, in a 
a cultural setting, we could call it, you know, Western post-Christian setting, where there are very sophisticated methods that, that arose in the German Enlightenment in, in particular, methods that are deployed in studying the Bible, which have tended to destroy faith in the Bible. And that's the majority opinion when you look at, you know, state universities and a lot of the large private graduate schools, divinity schools, a lot of them uh, are very skeptical about the Bible. Uh, I think there are a lot of reasons not to be convinced by their skepticism, but there it is. Um, and then you read what other chapter? 11 and 12. So the summary of 11, which has to do, chapter 11 has to do with the modern study of the Gospels. And I don't know if anybody found this interesting or useful. I like the testimony on page 164 by Paul Minier, who was a late Yale professor. And he just points out that in scholarly study of the Bible, there's often a penalty applied to God. That uh, God's not allowed to exist for the purposes of scholarly study from the standpoint of, of many scholars. And he was, he was very old when he wrote this book. He called it the Bible and the historian, breaking the silence about God in biblical studies. <laughs> but he sort of typifies this uh, tension in biblical studies that you have lots of people kind of tearing scripture down as they study it. And then you have some people coming along and saying, you know something, actually, we can't make good sense of the data without the God hypothesis. So that's what this chapter is meant to do, is to, is to uh, sh introduce students to the application of critical methods to the Gospels. And it does that. And then not only have the Gospels been studied very critically, but then even the life of Jesus itself as a subset of, of the Gospels. That's been uh, subjected to major uh, you know, human industry of learning and, and researching and writing. And that's chapter 12, The Modern Search for Jesus. And somewhere in there, I think uh, Walter Elwell writes this chapter because this was one of his specialties. And I think uh, he says something like, you know, in the early church, the idea of the quest for the historical Jesus wouldn't have made any sense. Uh, Jesus is not lost. We are. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the Enlightenment, uh, it was decided that uh, the Jesus of the Gospels, you know, he, he can't have been that way because he walked on water and he was born of a virgin. And, you know, at the Enlightenment, they said, well, miracles don't happen and we don't believe in the inspired nature of the Bible anymore. So what is really the truth about Jesus? Since the New Testament is very inaccurate. And they're still asking that question. And there's still no agreement on what must have happened to result in a the four Gospels, and be the early church. If Jesus wasn't kind of like the sources say he was, then what was he like? And how did this movement arise and all these, these things get written if he wasn't that way? And I think the best explanation is he was that way. And the reason Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote what they wrote is because that's pretty much what they saw and heard. And they didn't all copy off each other and get it exactly the same. There's quite a bit of variation, enough that you could talk about a problem. There are similarities and there are differences. <gasps> so how do we account for them? And they call that the synoptic problem. And there is a challenge there, but I don't think it requires us to say, well, either nothing happened or something happened, but it's nothing like what the Bible says. So at the summary on page 175, uh, you get a statement, number one, skepticism fostered in scholars since the Enlightenment dictates that anything that seems supernatural be ruled out or reinterpreted. That's just how scholars have approached the Jesus material. Uh, number two, Schweitzer observed that most 19th century scholars seeking to find historical Jesus removed Jesus from his place in history and inserted him into their own historical period. 
And so they read Jesus in the light of their own certainties, and they found a Jesus that more or less was a reflection of their own face in the well. Uh, somebody called Boltmann developed a method called demythologizing. He tried to reinterpret the early Christian myths, as he called them, uh, such as the incarnation and deity of Christ. It was a failed project. It was just another uh, version of skepticism. Uh, scholars conventionally divide the quest for Jesus into three, one that ended about 1900, one that uh, just was really the 1950s into the 60s, and then a new quest that began around 1980, the third quest. So the new quest is the second, the third quest is the one that's, we're kind of on the tail end of it now. Uh, there's something that was called the Jesus Seminar. I think it did its work and has moved on. Uh, there, number six, there are 25 criteria that are used to identify the authentic words of Jesus. Now for believers, uh, they're authentic if they're in scripture. <laughs> but for those who aren't believers, and you know, it doesn't hurt for believers to be aware I mean, some of it's just common sense, like uh, the, the, the criterion of multiple attestation. Uh, if, it says, if, if, if one gospel says it, that's enough for me, but if two or three gospels say it, well, even skeptics might say, well, he probably said that because several of the sources say it. An another one um, is uh, the criterion of dissimilarity. If Jesus says something that you you really can't trace it to the Greek world, and you can't trace it to the Jewish world either, then somebody had to think it up, and maybe it was him. <laughs> and so if there's something, especially it's multiply attested and it's distinct, then it's, it's hard to argue that somebody else made it up and put it in his mouth. That's probably, uh, that's probably um, authentic or genuine from Jesus. And finally, when historical research is conducted without presuppositions that rule out God's involvement, it can bring greater understanding of the Bible. In other words, uh, it's not so much the methods of historical criticism that are often the problem, it's the presuppositions that people have before they ever pick up the methods. So that's all the reading you did for today, right? Those chapters? And uh, is, is there anybody that has a, a testimony or a question on the reading of those particular chapters? Something that really struck you or went down sideways or... I was disappointed in Thomas Paine. <laughs> Thomas Paine was no friend of uh, confessional Christianity. Thomas Jefferson wasn't either, but, uh, you know, they, they did serve their historical purpose. <laughs> I guess my main comment would be, after going through seminary and hearing so much of the criticisms and all that we're talking about, after about a dozen years in the ministry, one of the things that just occurred to me was, what would happen if I would just take Scripture and believe it, period? what would come out different than had been there with all the doubt that was there. And part of that was because I was trying to look at it through their eyes as it happened in the first century, not 20 centuries later after the memories of things have gone and, and all of that. And I found a whole new appreciation of not just of scripture, but of not just what Jesus did, but what was being felt by the people who experienced it. And uh, for me, it was a life-changing thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the downside of a lot of modern theological education. Uh, and a lot of people never recover from it. You know, the seeds of doubt are sown in their young professional lives. And, uh, you know, they respect their professors, and especially if their professors are skeptics, uh, a lot of times it, it plants such a strong seed of doubt that they go through their whole ministry, if they stay in the ministry, and it's, uh, it's a pretty raw ordeal because they really don't have a, a word from God they can trust. And preaching becomes a pretty artificial exercise. That's why, by the way, uh, in this book, if, if you read most college textbooks, the opening chapters are about criticism. <laughs> 
and uh, we felt we needed to come clean with students about how the Bible's read in the modern world, but we wanted to get in about nine chapters on history and scripture. You know, root people in the reality of Jesus' coming and Jesus' times and his teaching and his person and what John says and what Matthew says and so on and so forth. Then after students have gotten a chance, because, you know, a lot of students when they go to college, they don't know the Bible, even if they come from Christian homes. So we want to give them a fighting chance to know what the Bible says, then talk about why people doubt it. And then go on, you know, we're going to go on in part two, you know, encountering Acts in the early church. And that's pretty much the end of our exposure to skepticism. But we didn't want to spend the whole time, as you, as you can do in seminary, and you also, a lot of colleges, every class you take, this is the big thing, is, is dealing with the naysayers. Yes, sir. Do you sense, maybe this is for another time, do you sense that uh, there is a, uh, the, the skeptics have lost ground in the last few years? And even the academic world. It seems to me when I was in seminary, Bultmann, all those guys were really having that. Then they're gone. Then the Jesus seminar comes on. Pretty soon they they just keep falling by the wayside. And people like uh, N.T. Wright and others that are coming in have done some marvelous things. Uh, and, and I may be just missing it, but F.F. F. Bruce has more influence today than he did when I was in school, it seems like. And it, it seems to me that there has been a move, at least over the whole of the evangelical church, that uh, we're feeling stronger about the validity of Scripture from just an academic standpoint than there was for that kind of mid-20th century skepticism. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the question is, uh, has there been a shift so that whereas in theological education, uh, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever, that there was uh, a lot more attention given to skepticism. And today, uh, there are a lot more places where you can go and, and they don't highlight the skepticism. Yeah. And the cultural uh, influence of the skepticism, is, at least from theologians in the seminaries, it's, it's not so strong. And, and I think, uh, undoubtedly, with the um, withering of the mainline churches, the, the relevance of theologians and mainline seminaries, I mean, it's less and less. Nobody's listening to them anymore. Um, the piece... They're in, and then they're, they're into social aspects. It seems like they, yeah. they, they're even dealing with it. And in that case, they're saying the same thing yeah. that social theorists are saying without the Bible. Yeah. Um, so they've painted themselves into a corner of irrelevance, and uh, uh, you know the the most recent notable example is with the PCUSA's you know uh, decisions on on same sex. Uh, they lost twenty percent of their members in one year. I mean, they were losing three five percent every year anyway. But twenty percent of your membership for a whole denomination. Now, their seminaries are endowed, so, so they'll go on, but the problem is they don't get students like they used to. <laughs> Who wants to go into the ministry to learn about Christianity when what you teach is not historic Christian teaching? Meanwhile, in developing nations, there's been an explosion. There's been more people come to Christ in the last 80 to 100 years than in the whole history of the church. <laughs> Hundreds of millions of people in Asia, Latin America, and Africa in particular. And uh, they are going to exert an upward pressure on biblical scholarship because the old line scholars who disbelieved everything are going to die. And uh, I'm praying that what will replace them is people that will take a book like this and go forward on the basis of uh, faith seeking understanding instead of skepticism seeking destruction which has been the tendency. Now, from their standpoint, it's skepticism uh, validating the truth because they think it's true that Jesus was not born a virgin. They think it's true that the Bible is myths. They think it's true that nobody ever rose from the dead. So that's their religion, and they call that critical thinking. But um, 
know, there was a time in the 20th century in particular where in Western thought the idea was the world's becoming less and less religious. But with the rise of, uh, or the, the resurgence of Islam, uh, with the resurgence of Hindu nationalism, you know, uh, India is a large percent of the people of, on the face of the earth. Um, with uh, the explosion of Christians in China, so that very shortly there'll be more Christians there, there than there are in North America. It's obvious, as Martin Marty put it recently, the world is not becoming less religious. You know, the, the, the secularization hypothesis is wrong. And so, the, the, you know, you're talking about a, a cultural mood in which seminaries were skeptical, and the idea was the whole world's becoming more skeptical, aren't they? Just like us. And while they were doing that, God was turning the tables, and the persecuted church was arising in places like China, and today, I think that's, that's the wave of the future. Now, you know, that might be preparing a way for great persecution. So we can't just say, oh, well, you know, well, we're going to usher in heaven here pretty soon. But we can be grateful that, as I said with the books on the resurrection, there are resources for thinking aggressively and positively about the claims of the Bible. Books that are written, uh, articles, study centers, initiatives all over the world, study, think tanks, uh, action groups, uh, church and parachurch. Resources that didn't exist even 20 years ago. So uh, I'm sorry that I'm getting so old so fast, you know, because the, the best is going to happen after I die, I'm afraid. But it is encouraging to see. And uh, some of the students, like I, I, got a, uh, I got an email from a student. She was a student of mine, you know, back in the 2006, 8 range when I taught up north of Chicago. But, I mean, she was remarkable. She was... Uh, French Swiss, so French speaking Swiss, but of course that meant she spoke German. And uh, her English was very good. But along with French, and, and by dint of much effort and love, uh, her first language was Mandarin. And she had studied and taught in China, taught languages in China, and came to us north of Chicago, did a, a master's degree there. She did a term paper for me. Uh, that I urged her to publish, it was so good. And then uh, she's now finishing up at Cambridge University in, uh, in England. She'll be submitting her dissertation very soon. She wrote to me and asked if I'd be a reference if she applied to some schools. Um, but all the time she's been in Cambridge, and it's taken her a few extra years because she's been ministering to Chinese groups there, and especially people from mainland China you know, they come to Cambridge to study all kinds of things. And she's part of a fellowship where a lot of them, you know, they're not Christians, but they come to Cambridge and they're, they're interested in university-level lectures on Christianity because they're trying to get educated about the West. And so she's part of a group of people that are discipling Chinese intellectuals. Now, how many, how many students could do that? <laughs> Disciple Chinese people in Mandarin. But that's the kind of thing that's happening around the world now that, um, you know, I feel sorry for, for skeptical seminary professors in North America who think that somehow they're going to kill the word of God by their critical methods when God is just, he's just gone around the end of it. And, you know, he's just doing what he's going to do. I hope that's encouraging to you. Excuse me? The hammer that breaks the rock. That's right. Jeremiah's hammer uh, that breaks the rock in pieces. And that's a good note. To uh, take a break. I'll see you in five minutes.